Is it possible that the last universal common ancestor came from a world that preceded it that was solely based on RNA? It's called the RNA world hypothesis. And today we are going to look into whether it is viable or not. Let's explore. Peace be upon you all, and welcome to this new session where we will be diving deeper into the proposals of the theory of evolution. In a previous session, we have looked into what is mutation, which is essentially random changes to the genetic material of an organism, primarily copying errors during the process of replication. We looked into the DNA nuclear material that encodes the information and all the associated machinery and enzymes that will transcribe it into RNA and translate the RNA into proteins and the magnificent error correction mechanisms that are there. And this led scientists to say that DNA-based life is so complex, it cannot be how life started. But for life to start, you need a molecule to put the genetic information on it, and you need a kind of an enzyme to catalyze the replication process to be able to reproduce. But without reproduction, there is no life, and without information, you have nothing to code for. So the proposal was that since RNA also stores genetic material as a second stage, intermediate stage between DNA and proteins, and since RNA can also be material for enzymes, then since RNA is much simpler than DNA, maybe, maybe life started from the simpler side, which is the RNA. And hence, evolutionary uh, theorists proposed a hypothesis that life started based on RNA in a world that did not have DNA and did not have proteins. The genetic information, the enzymes, both are RNA-based. But is this possible? Well, first, we need to establish that life needs enzymes, because enzymes in the cell can make chemical reactions happen in the order of trillions of times faster than if you leave them to happen autonomously. It means that without enzymes, reactions that are essential for life will practically never happen in any proper time. So RNA has this uh, property that an RNA molecule, which has nucleotides, can store those nucleotides, but can also be a catalyst for a reaction. It can even be a catalyst for its own replication. So maybe life started by those, um, by this RNA strands in uh, 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 early life that copied itself also. But unfortunately, when you have a strand that is long enough, the autocatalytic self-replication will not work with any proper efficiency. So now we have to find another way. Maybe the RNA genetic information um, was replicated using an enzyme that is itself RNA-based. So we look into the RNA genetic information that we have around us. We have pseudo-living organisms called viruses, of which are RNA viruses. And there are RNA viruses that will replicate themselves by converting their genetic material into DNA first through uh, reverse transcription, so we'll put them aside because this is the RNA world hypothesis. There is no DNA. Remaining is the normal RNA viruses. And good news, they have an enzyme that replicates their genetic material, which is in RNA. And this enzyme is coded on the RNA material in some cases. It does not borrow the enzyme from the host cell. So problem solved. But bad news, this enzyme, which is called RNA 
or machine, which is called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, is essentially a protein enzyme. And since this is the RNA world hypothesis, we cannot or we should not invoke a protein enzyme. But, hmm, this is a paradox. It will destroy the whole thing. So, let's just go with the flow. Let's assume that one way or the other, this enzyme existed and also coded on the RNA material itself. So, when it's copied, the new organism will be able to produce that enzyme. But the problem is, to produce that enzyme, which is coded on the RNA, we will need to translate the RNA. We will need something that will read the RNA and produce this protein enzyme so that it can exist for replication. And we know that this process is called translation and it needs a machine called a ribosome. So, mm, can we have ribosomes in early creatures? Well, the problem is ribosomes are pretty complex machines. And guess what? Ribosomes have at least 35% of their constituents proteins, and it can go even higher. So, we are back again to the same paradox. We are in the RNA world that should not have proteins in them, but we are solving the problem with proteins. But can we assume that ribosomes were also there and they did the translation for the RNA material which produced the proteins of which will be the replicase enzyme that can be used to replicate the RNA? Well, the problem is that Proteins are pretty complex in their manufacturing. It's not only that they are translated through the ribosomes, but after they are produced, they need to be folded. And to be folded into their 3D structure, they need enzymes to help them while folding. And of those enzymes and enzymatic machines are the ribosomes themselves. So you need the ribosome to produce the protein, but uh, the protein itself needs to be folded, which needs the ribosome to be there to fold the protein, and the protein itself will be part of the ribosome. So you need the ribosome to manufacture the ribosome. Another paradox. But let's assume that we look the other side, and just like we assumed that we had the RNA replicase one way or the other there, we also assume that we have the ribosome one way or the other there. So, it's already a paradox and we should stop here because it doesn't work, but let's assume. But now, we have a problem. Because coding for all of this needs an even bigger and bigger and bigger RNA genetic material. Because we're coding for all of those enzymes not just for replication, we need the ribosomes and with the enzymes that fold the proteins, etc. And we know that we have a problem that if RNA gets long with its bad performance in terms of error correction and very high mutation rates, that replication will be lethal. This problem is even further compounded because this RNA and the associated enzymes that we need cannot sit in vacuum. All those chemical reactions need energy, and energy needs that we need metabolism. And for metabolism to occur, we need obviously to grab food, but we need enzymes to catalyze the process of converting food to energy. So we need to code for even more enzymes on the RNA material. And all of this cannot be just floating in water. It needs to be enclosed so that there is bondage for the system, and then we need a cellular membrane. And cellular membranes are pretty complex structures with all of those proteins and other compounds there. So we still need to code for the membrane. Now the RNA material is getting bigger and bigger. What is the minimum, minimum, minimum that we can have to have an autonomous being that is living and based on RNA? Well, from looking around us, 
we find that the smallest genome that is available today, that's been identified by scientists to be autonomously living, if it's beyond that, it's not considered autonomously living, they can consider that organelle, for, an organelle, for example, is the genome of an organism called M. genitalium. And the length of the genome of M. genitalium is 580 kilobases, and it is DNA-based. So is it possible that we had RNA genome 580 kilobases long? Let's look at what we find today in operation. We know that today, the average RNA virus genome is only 9 kilobases. And the biggest RNA virus genome is only 29 kilobases. But maybe this is a problem with viruses. Maybe we cannot have a virus that's bigger than that. But bad news, we have viruses that are more than 1 million kilobases, 1 million bases. But they are DNA viruses. So it looks like that this is a problem with the RNA coding, not with viruses. It's a feature of an RNA genome. It cannot surpass a certain length boundary. This is not just a theoretical issue. It is actually practically used to create drugs to push the viral genome beyond a specific value so that mutation will become lethal to it if its genome passes this value. I have, by the way, put plenty of references in the description for everything that I'm saying to you today. So have your time and read article number four on the course website and have fun with the reading material. So now, we end up with the RNA hypothesis that should have solved the problem, having even more problems than what we wanted to solve. And guess what? The metabolic process that is essential for the cell to work will generate of its own, due to the chemical reactions that are involved in the metabolism, will induce even more mutations in the RNA code. Maybe that's why we never find viruses that metabolize their food and they will only uh, uh, capture and hijack machinery from the cells that are DNA based that can sustain themselves because they have DNA damage repair. Well, we need to ask the ultimate question. Was there ever an RNA world? You see, the problem of the theory of evolution is that it is trying to solve the complex questions of life. And when it goes to a question, it finds that the question is pretty complex. It tries to break up the problem into small pieces and solve each problem separately. And this is okay. But the big question is, when we take the solutions and put them together, will they match or will they be paradoxically mutually exclusive? So that if you assume that one solution is valid, it will cause the other solutions to be invalid. And hence, you do not have a solution. We will look into that when we find, look at the summary of the paradoxes of the RNA world hypothesis. But, you know, evolutionary biologists are also smart people. They always try to find solutions. So one of the solutions that, okay, it's not Luca. There was an RNA world before Luca. Now RNA world does not look to be working. Maybe there was a pre-RNA world before the RNA world. Maybe the organisms that uh, where in the RNA world um, co-evolved genetic expression uh, together with uh, genetic material. Maybe we had little uh, uh, organisms that are not fully uh, uh, um, living, but they had fragments of genetic material and each uh, um, uh, little organism was doing just part of the job and they were exchanging um, uh, uh, benefits in a cooperative way. But does any of this solve the real core problems? Or they will just break up the problems and when you try to put them together again, you will end up at the same situation. Well, I'll just wrap it up here. At a point of time, however or whatever way you want to break it up, you will need to come together 
with an organism that is RNA-based, that is living, that is autonomously living. And when you reach this organism, you will face the paradoxes, regardless how you reach it. Because we want to go forward beyond Luca and look at other problems with the theory, we will not just keep pushing the can and looking for extra paradoxes at that era. Because pushing the can, which is one of the major techniques used by the theory, solves nothing. Before I leave you, let's look at a summary for the four paradoxes of the RNA world hypothesis. What was the problem we were trying to solve? The problem was that we need a world in which genetic material is stored, is replicated, with an energy source and a cell membrane, but without DNA. So paradox number one, we know that the existing life uses DNA with error correction plus RNA and protein enzymes, which is too complex. And we try to solve it by going a step back for RNA. But then we need to have an RNA replication and we know a long strand of RNA cannot autocatalyze. So we end up needing RNA replicase to replicate RNA. But guess what? RNA replicase is a protein. <laughs> it is a paradox, given that we said that this is the RNA world. Paradox number two. Even if we accept RNA replicase, we still don't have an error correction mechanism. Because even with RNA replicase today, a virus will have one million times the mutation rate of its whole cell. So, even this does not solve it. Because this kind of mutation in an autonomous living cell will destroy it. Paradox number three. We need this cell to metabolize. And we need a cell membrane. And since we need those, we really need a pretty big genome. And once we need a pretty big genome, we know that this will not be sustainable, given the maximum size of RNA genome that we know of today. So the solution for the short genome is to be a big genome. Seems like the third paradox to me. And number four, if we try to address the problem by breaking up life even further than the RNA world hypothesis tries, or we try to appeal to cooperativeness between smaller organisms, or to co-evolution, at one point, we still to reach to the point where there is an independent, autonomously living RNA organism, and once we reach it, we are back to the same paradox again regardless how we reach there. So if we try to break it up, we'll end up summing it up. It doesn't solve anything. I leave you with the thought to contemplate on the theory of evolution and its hypotheses. And see you soon on Saturday for the live stream. Please do send me your questions on the, uh, according to the instructions of the course questions and answers and see you next session where we will be looking more into enzymes and proteins for another paradox.